The Challenge Coins are back in stock. Sometimes we all need a little reminder around to let us know that we're not alone and there are people out there who understand our suffering. Keep it for yourself or give it to somebody in need. 100% of our proceeds go to dented development projects so they can continue their mission of taking care of first responders and their families. Go to thesufferingpodcast.com or denteddevelopmentproject.com to find details on how to order. We're in this together. Don't ever forget that. Welcome to The Suffering Podcast. Each week, we walk you through how suffering is the way to sustainable success and the path to greatness. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and many more. Visit thesufferingpodcast.com for complete details. Please subscribe and like to get our latest episodes as soon as they drop. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for exclusive content. Please comment. We may read your comments on future shows or even reach out to you for a future guest appearance. Let's embrace how suffering forges bonds that last forever, showing we are never alone. So get so ready, get ready, get sit, ready down, sit down, sit down, and strap and it. Strap it. Sit your ass down, down. Sit your ass down, down. Let's talk about the suffering. It's time to start to pay the pain. Sit your ass down, down. Sit your ass down, down. And strap it, strap it. This is gonna hurt, gonna hurt. This is gonna hurt, gonna hurt. Let's talk about the suffering. It's time to start the pain. This is gonna hurt. It's time for the Suffering Podcast. Dented Development Project is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to assist first responders and their families repair dents caused by suffering. Help us support the ones who take care of us selflessly. Dented things can still operate, but may not be as pretty as they once were. Make a difference and go to denteddevelopmentproject.com to get involved today. Our heroes need our help. All new Suffering Podcast gear is here. The show depends heavily on our supporters to get the word out. Let people know that suffering is a team sport and no one is alone in their struggles. Wearing the Suffering Podcast merchandise accomplishes that goal. Check out our store at thesufferingpodcast.com or check our show notes for the link. Your support and love means everything to us. We go through our lives hoping to make it to old age. We never think about the difficulties and roadblocks that may be put in front of us. We think we're going to be strong, young, and healthy forever. Then one day, on a dime, things change. This unbearable truth hits us, and we're forced to face our own mortality. It's very difficult being told that you don't have a 100% chance of survival. Now, you have to bring that uncertainty into the world and tell those around you in your circle that death is a possibility. Your attitude will most certainly change about all aspects of life. What have I not done? Who will miss me? Will I be forgotten? Have I lived my life to the fullest? I'm Kevin Donaldson here with Mike Felace, and on this episode of The Suffering Podcast, we sit down with Tara Madalone to discuss the suffering of cancer. Tara has fought through all these questions and many more to gain resiliency in surviving. Tara, thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. <laughs> it's okay. You can. Tara's a little nervous, so we're she's gonna. A little, she's a little rigid right now. You know? We got bottles of uh, what's your drink of choice? <laughs> we got bottles. We'll, don't worry, we'll take care of it. We'll we'll loosen you up. You're totally out of my comfort zone, but it's good. Well, that's what you have to do. You have to step out of your comfort zone. You have to suffer, suffer a little bit to uh, to get through it. So. And when you're done. You'll be like, ah, that was a piece of cake. This is nothing. <laughs> She's suffering right now too. <laughs> <laughs> you How right am I? <laughs> you haven't stopped. So, you haven't stopped smiling since you came in, and I, I take that as a very good thing. Okay? Yeah, it's good. All right, because so, I'm here. Of course. But of course. Of course, because she's not the most feminine person in the room. Are we done? <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to do. It. <laughs> Before we get into anything, I want to get into this week's social media question, and it comes from Gene. How do you react in your head 
when others talk about their suffering. Tara, I know you're in the medical field and people unload on you certain times. I grabbed this one specifically because I knew you were coming in today. When somebody, a patient of yours, starts telling you their trials and tribulations, not what you say verbally, but what's going on in the back of your head, do you think you can quantify that? I think at this point, I can actually relate to what they're saying and I can understand what they're saying and I understand the emotions that go behind what they're saying and what they're feeling because now I've been there. You got some perspective. I got some, yeah, different perspective. You had to go through certain things. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into that later because I want to know what your experience has done to your bedside manner. Because I think that's really important because what you just said, you got a little bit more perspective on their side now. You were on the other side Mm -hmm. of that hospital gown. I was the facilitator in helping them get through Mm -hmm. what their current situation is. But now I was the one going through what they're going through. So I understand the fear. I understand, you know, the questions that they have when they come in and the whole thought process and emotions behind it. There was a great movie called The Doctor with the late William Hurt. Did you ever see this movie? No. So I think everybody in the medical profession should see this movie. It's probably 25 years old, maybe even 30 years old. And he is a doctor. Did you watch it when you were 40? (laughs) (laughs) If I'm 40, brother, what the hell are you? So what it is is he was a doctor and and he was very detached from his patients. He'd been a doctor for so long and I think he gets throat cancer or something like that. And he has to sit on the other side of the curtain. When he finally does get, I'm going to, spoiler alert, I'm going to ruin it. He does get better. His bedside manner changes just like that. Now, Mike, you and I. We listened to, I thought this was very apt. This is our final audio recording in this studio. Uh, We've already said our goodbyes to the studio, but you and I have listened to a lot of suffering in this studio. So I'm not talking about what you say. Actually, man, this might be a bad question for you because you got a fucked up head, dude. Thinking the same thing. (laughs) You want to know what's going on in my head when someone's saying something? It's like a Picasso painting. (laughs) Tell me a little bit in the back of your head what you think about when somebody's really bearing their soul. You know what? It's like you almost put yourself in their situation. You know, you almost live their pain with them. If you have a related pain to that, you know, like Tara was saying, you know, she's been through that. She knows it. You can't really grasp it. If someone, I mean, you show remorse for them or or however you want to put that, that you feel for them. But unless you've really been through that. That's the empathy versus sympathy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can be empathetic. But you can't be sympathetic if you've never gone through it. Correct. You know, know, like I said, we talk to people that are involved in shootings all the time. We know what they feel. Gene Halberg, we bring him up all the time. I can't feel his pain because he lost his son. Like, I'm empathetic to those people who are bald, but I'm not bald, so therefore I cannot sympathize. I can't wait till the day you go. By the time we finish this podcast, you're going to be drop dead bald and I'm going to laugh my ass off. But I'm also going to have five heart attacks. (laughs) Uh, I'll probably stroke out. You know, listen, the medical, uh, I'll be going to see Tara. I'll be wheeling you in in a wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, listen, don't soil your pants or anything, but I'm going to give you a big shout out here. When about time. When somebody is in the chair that Tara's in and they're telling us some really bad stuff. If I was sitting in this chair all alone without Mike or or Mike is my partner in, in the bedroom as well as on the table. Sometimes. If he was not here to diffuse a lot of these things, I think I would have broken a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So in the back of my head, what I'm thinking is like, I said, thank God Mike's here because this is rough. Like, this is really rough. You know, and that's how we do it. And that's, you know, some people object to some of the humor because some of the humor in this comes out at the most inappropriate times. And Mm -hmm. that's to break the levity and, you know, move on from it. To bring the levity. Bring the levity. I'm here to educate. But you need humor because that's how I got through a lot of what I went through. I had to bring humor to it because if not, well, it's that, just... That's anybody who sees that trauma every single day yeah. has to deal with it with humor because otherwise you're going to drink yourself. You might do something else that's really bad behavior or really unhealthy behavior. So we you, that's the way we do it. And if I, I don't think I could do this show alone. I, it's just I'm dealing with two heavy subjects that I can't. I don't think I could take it on my own. You wouldn't be as successful if you did it alone. Probably not. Probably not. Don't feed into his (laughs) ego, Tara. Don't do it. His his ego barely fits down the stairs now. And now that we're on camera. That's why we had to get a new studio because, you know, my head won't fit. (laughs) So, Tara, there's a couple things that I really, really love about your personality. 
And somebody coming from your background, what you've gone through in your field, I know you've listened to a couple episodes of the Suffering Podcast. I'm interested to hear what you think about it. I think they're great. I think they're very useful for somebody going through whatever they're going through because it's like, oh, wow, there's somebody out there that's going through the same thing either I went through or I'm going through now. And I think you can learn from other people, maybe how they've dealt with certain situations and you kind of feed off of that. We say all the time, you're not alone. You know, when you're going, when you went through what you're going through, you feel like you're all alone. There's other people out there that went through that Mm -hmm. and could help you out and walk you like you're doing now in your, in your job. You, you know, Kevin brought up bedside manner. I bet your bedside manner is a lot better now because you're empathetic to them. Yeah. It's not, it's not somewhere just a job anymore. It's, I've been there. So, so how how do we get the Suffering Podcast piped into the facility that you work in as like that elevator music they play in those places sucks? So we need the Suffering Podcast. We need dark humor. We need to be making fun of people. So We need people you, laughing in the waiting room, you know? Yeah, hook us up. <laughs> hook us up. I will try. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine somebody like Bobby Crudell saying, yeah, they're, they're sticking this up my ass and doing it? Oh, dear Lord. But, so, you know, it, what we could do is get a picture of us in, in like, the waiting room, and people walk in, look at our faces, and they won't feel like bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. It's all about perspective. It's all about perspective. I know I got spinal meningitis, <laughs> and but it's it's at least I'm not them. At least Ta- I don't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> Tara, uh, you know, the first time I, I, I know a little bit of your background, and the first time I spoke with you, I was, I was taken back by your very bubbly you're very like, yeah, you know, this is just what it is. This is this is no big deal. So I want you to tell our audience a little bit about you. Mm-hmm. This is the toughest question that we ask people because people don't want to seem like egomaniacs. Mike and I ask us what what about ourselves. Yeah, I did this. I did this. I did this. <laughs> is. But you I, tell us like wh- where you're from, what you do, what do, I do? Um, what's your blood type. I don't know. I'm from Leonard's, raised by two very great, hardworking parents that probably instilled in me all my morals and my values you know, who basically I am today. What do you think um, the the best moral value you learned from your parents was? It's just to be a good person, have respect for one another, have respect for yourself, and just try to help people any way that you can. And I think that's what kind of drew me to my to the field that I'm in. Which is? is, is the, I'm in the medical field, and I, I love to help people in, in any way that I can. Specifically in the medical field, what? Are, what are your responsibilities? What's right your expertise? I, well, right now I do. I work in oncology, but I do more, you know, medical administration in oncology. So I work with four physicians who are really renowned throughout the country. I help facilitate them with research, and that's what I'm, I'm basically doing right now. So I know cancer patients lose their hair. Did, did they? Here did, we go. Did they invent the hair growing machine yet? Not yet. They, it's probably right next to the face off machine. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, I think I leaned on that machine because I got hair growing on my back like it's going out of style. I was saying after you're done with the hair growing machine, go to the face off machine just to get a better look. It's an interesting field, but I imagine it's it's a very tough field because not everybody makes it. There is no such thing as 100 percent cancer survival rate. No, but from the time that I've I guess I've I've been where I am for 20 years. So from the time that I've started to now, there's been um, a lot of change in growth, new studies, people are living longer, a lot more treatments. Cancer is more basically like a, a chronic illness. It's not so much more of a death sentence anymore. And there's a lot of a lot of new treatments bringing a lot of new hope for people. So I've seen I've seen it grow. Unless you get you know, that pancreatic changes. shit. Yeah, that's a yeah, springboard. That, that's a bad one. That's but, a I mean, that's got to be tough for you going through what you went through. I mean, we'll get into it, but to work in oncology, I mean, that's... It's rewarding. I mean, it's... It's I don't want to say it's your field, you know, but you have knowledge in that field, which is... Well, leading into that, you are probably the most qualified amongst many people to work in the oncology field because you have a very interesting suffering story. So why don't you let us in on that? Well, let's see. So I was diagnosed with breast cancer three years ago at the age of 38. My mom had was diagnosed about, I think, a year or two prior. We didn't have any family history of breast cancer. They thought hers was mostly due to um, postmenopausal. So when she was diagnosed, she was like, I want you to get checked every year. So I started routine mammography screenings, and they found out that I had calcifications in my right breast. 
And so I, I saw what they do during those mammographies. They squeeze the shit out of them. Oh my god, that's, that's I'm looking at them like that's that's horrible. That's awful. It Imagine was, if we had to get screened for testicular cancer the same way. I was just thinking the same thing. No, they're awful <laughs> if you're really small in size. And at that time, I wasn't small in size, so it wasn't that bad. Just like a pinch. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. It was okay. Uh, but I, I, I forget. I forget where I saw one. I think I, it was one of the health classes, and they were showing it. And listen, I, I was a 15 year old boy, so I thought it was really cool to see a boob. <laughs> oh, boobies! Booby. But then I watched, I watched it getting clamped into like one of those compressors. I'm like, oh my god, what are they doing? What are they doing? You had to go through one of those. And and how often does a normal woman have to go through a mammography? It's usually exam? once a year, um, you know, unless they have a, a history of something, then they may do it every six months. But and I think now they tell you to wait till you're the age of 40 if you don't have a history of breast cancer. So I was at the age of 38 when I was. I was diagnosed. So if I waited till I was the age of 40, I think my story would have been totally different than than how it turned out. So you think um, that's a hole in the system? No, but I think you need to be your own advocate. Like my mother was like, you're not waiting till you're the age of 40. And But the problem is with that, and I know this firsthand, that if you, some insurances will not pay until you hit 40. I think I paid. You, uh, I think I paid a small fee, but I And paid. listen, to save your yeah. life, I, I get it. I get it. But I think it's... I, Is I it think, really a price you could put on saving your life? You yeah. know? True. But I think the, the health insurance, I think it's really douchey of the health insurance industry to do that. The health insurance industry wants you to get sick before they pay. Then yeah. they'll start paying. That's how they make money. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's disgusting. But that, that, for me, I find that abhorrent that they're doing that, where had you waited... You know, that test that you paid for saved your life. Mm -hmm. So take us down. You find out you have these calcifications. So, yes, I had to get a biopsy. And and sometimes with calcifications, you don't have to do anything. They're they're fine. So they did the biopsy, and mine was DCIS, which is called ductus carcinoma in situ. So it was just in the ducts that had not yet um, been invasive or had spread anywhere that we had known at that time. So usually when you have that diagnosis, they'll do what they call a lumpectomy to remove the tissue and, and surrounding tissue to make sure that they successfully clear your margins, so to speak. Can't they get a better word for it, though, than lumpectomy? Yeah. Uh-huh. You know? Detitification so, or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, something, something like that. I... Well, I had that at the end, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so... Well, what, what was your word the other week? What was your word when, when Ashley was in here? A, vag- a vagisectomy. Vag- vag- vagisectomy. <laughs> vagisectomy. Yeah. So we're. Did you have like a vagisectomy? <laughs> so we're creating all new, like a titanectomy. Uh, something like a. Oh, de- new no, medical it's de- terminology. Yeah. Detitification. Detitification. What, so they do this lumpectomy, and do they find what they're looking so for? So in, in my case, because my centi- my excuse me, my um, calcifications, they were eight centimeters in size. In order to remove them and successfully clear the margins, he had said I had to basically remove most of my breast. And he suggested that I just remove my right breast. So I said, well, if you're going to remove my right breast, then you're going to take off the left. And we're just going to start over again. It's like an Angelina Jolie situation. Yeah. Um, but you walking in circles yeah. if one was sticking <laughs> out. Of because I was like, you're gonna, if you're going to remove, like, I want them to yeah. look the same. You know, you're going to remove one and I'm going to have... You one there, level, like it's just you got to level out. Yeah, you know, it just, it just made sense. Just not like they could move yeah. the one to the center. Yeah, it just, <laughs> but in hindsight, after I had my surgery and on the final pathology, I had DCIS in my left as well, but it was undetected because it was too small to detect at the time. So, so that it was, was really a smart move on your part. Yeah, then. to me that was a no-brainer. You're gonna take off the right, you're taking off well, the that, left. Like that's it. I bring up Angelina Jolie because I know she had him just. There was no cancer in there. She had she just took him off. Like obviously she had fake ones put in. Do you think that that is a good path, especially when women are are not having children or beyond ch- having children, where they don't have to worry about breastfeeding or anything like that? Do you do you think that that is a good path to take? Or something that at least the insurance companies should look at. Hey, look, I got, you got a family history of breast cancer. Let's chop those puppies off. Um, I mean, for me, that was the correct choice. Uh, for another person, they may have feel totally comfortable with what, you know, because I always told you don't have to remove your left. You can, you know, you can still have it. I don't think they make bras like that. You know, That's the problem. But <laughs> <laughs> I think it really comes down to a, a personal choice. Hmm. Um, and for me... 
that was what felt most comfortable. And in hindsight, for me, that's basically what saved me. I look at my poor mother, and I shouldn't say my poor mother, but she has both her breasts. And every year she has to get checked. And every year I see the fear in her face when she has to go. And she's like, I should have just. I should have just removed them. <laughs> well, we are is, is it too late to get them removed? Or? No, she could. You know, you, you, you could if, if she wanted to. But for her, it's, it's too big of a process at, at this point. And she's been, she's been cancer-free now almost six years. So. Is, is it, like, painful? Or is it just... Did you feel anything when you had this? Like, or did you find it just to check? You mean the calcifications? Yeah. I couldn't feel them. And it didn't hurt? There's no, no pain? No, I okay. couldn't feel them. Um, my mother was prone to lumps, um, so she was able to, you know, feel her lump. Um, I couldn't feel what I had. I used to do that back in high school. Check for a lump on the top yeah. of your shoulders? No, on, oh. on your women's breasts. Yeah. Uh, well, oh, you the, gave breast exams. The That's Suffering right? Podcast uh, yeah, yeah. Medical yeah. Oncology Studio. Yeah. Since this studio is no longer going to be used... We should just open up. Hey, look, come down. You're good. Titification studio. <laughs> De- <laughs> Detitification. <laughs> now, once they're once they're out, and they they eradicate all the cancer in there, is there a reconstruction process? Yes. All right. So the reconstruction process actually starts when you have your surgery. So you have two surgeons. Uh, you have your breast surgeon who actually removes your breasts, and then you have your plastic surgeon that works right alongside him. So at that point, they put what they call tissue expanders in to expand your your Skin. tissue. Um, and I was like, what the heck am I going to look like <laughs> was it, after you, this? I had no idea what I was going to look like. Did you also have chemo? I did not need chemo because... Okay. So you um, didn't have to get one of those ports put in. Well, it, mine was non-invasive because right before they did my surgery, they do, um, do a, a lymph node biopsy to make sure it has not gone into your lymph nodes. So based on that, I was fortunate that it did not. And the pathology, I did not need chemo or um, radiation or um, tamoxifen or um, there was another drug too that you could take. Well, this is going to, well. this is going to sound really harsh, but I, I don't mean it to be harsh. I'm, I'm, I'm asking this because I'm curious when they, when you say remove your breast, is it like shelling out a cantaloupe or is it like taking a cantaloupe off and just like and then putting it back. No, it's totally removing. So the do, they, do they have to? Do they have to like remove the nipple and everything yes. like that? They so, do. So everything was off. Like, so you have to get a reconstructed nipple. Yes. I, I'm, I no, po- you I, po- ask. I apologize. This is this is no reconstructing the nipple. Did they have to take like skin somewhere? And where where was the skin from? Because I don't have any other skin on my body that matches what my nipples look like. So, Usually they take off the tip of your pinky, I think. <laughs> <laughs> little toe. <laughs> so in my case, they actually use skin from my stomach um, because at the same time when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I was diagnosed with Cushing's disease. Um, I had a tumor on my pituitary gland. Did you um, piss somebody off? I think nothing? I did. Yeah. You know. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it big. I'm going to do it all the way. <laughs> go big yeah. or go home. Oh, yeah, well, go big or go home. So we might as well have two major medical diagnoses at the same time. But I think, Mike, you re- I don't know if you remember, it was about 100 pounds overweight because the Cushing's caused me to have excessive weight gain and a whole bunch of other problems added to whatever I was going through at the time. So anyway, when I got my brain surgery, I started to lose all that weight and I had a lot of extra skin on me. So my plastic surgeon took the extra skin on my stomach, kind of gave me a, a tummy tuck and took that skin and made my nipples. And that's how we made my nipples that way. And I'm not quite done yet. You got a free t- free tummy tuck. <laughs> yeah, got a free tummy tuck. Literally did. So you were knocked down with the breast cancer. And then while you were down on the ground, you got kicked with the brain cancer. Mine was it. It wasn't brain cancer. It was a pituitary adenoma, so it was not cancerous, but it was causing a lot of other imbalances in my body. Do you do you want to share some of those other imbalances? Um. So I had my cortisol levels were high. My ACTH levels were high. Like I said, I was excessively overweight. I had. Did you have a lot of phase. stress, or was it just the cortisol levels? Because cortisol is the stress hormone, right? Like, um. Was it? Was it? It was like constantly being on speed. I had like all these. I was just like constantly going. Like my my body was just like in overdrive. 
Really? Well, yeah. I guess I guess that's good for work. Your your job probably loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Here she comes again. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> one thirty six hour shift after another. Tower of the tornado. Here she comes. This is this is an incredible story. So, and you have such a great attitude. I'd be really I got be kind of pissed off. Either that or I'd be playing the lottery constantly. You Somebody know, owes you something. You don't have time to be pissed off because I was in the mode that all right, I just I needed to we knew what was wrong with me and actually it was I was happy when they diagnosed the Cushing's disease because I didn't know what was wrong with me and I wasn't you know, I look at myself in the mirror and go, This is like not me. Like I don't know what's going on with me, but this is this is not me. This is not how I look. And so that was a relief to finally go, oh, wow, I know what's wrong with me now. And now I can actually get back to being myself. So I didn't really have time to, you know, say, be mad or angry or, or like, why is this me? It was There's just like. No, what was me? No, time. it's just like, you know, all right, Tara, let's get in the game. Let's put our A game on. We're dealing with the breast cancer. OK, we have a plan. I did my breast surgery. I was out for a month. Um, and went back to work for a month, and then I had okay, my brain surgery was in December, so we're just we're just gonna keep going down the line here and just doing what we need to do. Which one was which one was worse as far as recovery? Oh, the brain surgery. To explain that a little totally. bit, so we cut. Let's let's start with breast cancer recovery. So what what's that recovery like? All right, so with the breast cancer, I had my surgery. They put your tissue expanders in, and then they start expanding you. And they what they do is you have a port, and they put saline via your port it looks like a pig's nose right well actually you couldn't see it It was like it was like a metal port and they had like this metal finder and then you just take the needle and you put the needle in the port port, and then the you know the the iv just 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 drips right in okay and you expand to to the point where you pick your size so to speak never knew that (laughs) talk a a little more please i never knew that you had all these decisions to pick out what kind of new breasts that you wanted but i guess okay. it's dependent on what guy what guy you start dating i'm like you, you like them bigger like oh my god you, it's like go, hanging a picture a little bit to the left a little yeah. bit to the left but that was the question so tower how big do you want to be go like, big or you, go you, home exactly you're gonna go big i mean you gotta go big i'm like oh my god like i, I couldn't believe people were asking me these questions I was like no please. it would have been my it would have been my <laughs> question i'm sorry that's what kevin said when he went for his penisectomy <laughs> <laughs> A little bit more, Doc. A little bit more. But it's a, it's a very interesting They over-circumcise me. It's not my fault. <laughs> so, the, you know, they expand you to the size that you want to be. And then once you do that, then they go in and they put in your implants. And okay. so I that took about five surgeries just to do the breast surgery. Because as I was going through the process, I kept losing weight. And I was not happy with the size that I was. So I said, no, we're changing these puppies time to get new ones they're 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 not what they're not what i'm looking for so but in between that process then i had my brain surgery and that was rough that was what was so rough about it because they have a process that they want you to what they call crash where it's like you go from like having all this energy to like having no energy and that's basically telling you that what they did is is working so i would say for a good two months i was on the couch like with i would sleep in like 24 hours did they did they screw like your endocrine system or something well it's basically your endocrine system having to work itself to get back to normal so i was regenerate regenerate so i was on a year of um steroids hydrocortisone which actually they started to wean me off and everything started to to get jacked started going to the gym right she was doing fitness shows and everything (laughs) No, not like that. She's I mean, bouncing in clubs <laughs> all across North Jersey. Was it given to you by a Russian doctor? No, it was given to me by a great endocrinologist. Okay. Who, love her to death. She's the one who found out what was wrong with me. But it, that was more of a process because I, you go from having energy to like being like none. So that was horrible. And me, I'm active. Like it, you know, I just wanted to get back to normal, back to myself. So I think that was the roughest part. Now, how long did it take you to to reach some sort of homeostasis where you actually got back to feeling somewhat normal? There's um, a lot of big words thrown out here. So if you no, guys I was need just help, just going to say that I'm, I got to bring a dictionary next time. If you guys need help translation, because I I do speak stupid. I heard you say homo. That's the only thing I heard. <laughs> you mean from from everything? No, just you know. You said you crashed. You were you were on the couch for two months. By February, I went back to work in February. From so, so how was, long is that? To so it was December. Was your surgery did December? You say? Fourth, yeah. All right, so there. two months mm-hmm. till you were able to get rejoin society in somewhat of a normal fashion. Yeah, and I rejoined society, and COVID hit. <laughs> <laughs> and so this, again, this another primar- kick in the nuts. I was say, this is primarily recent, then. <laughs> yeah, that's that's some bad stuff. Yeah. Like that. 
<sighs> but I didn't care. I was back to work. I wanted. I needed to get back to normalcy for now, me, and that was normalcy. Did you have to take any further precautions, given your medical history, when COVID hit? And not to get into a COVID discussion or anything, were you, I imagine it was a little scary. Hey, look, I just got over this stuff. I, I'm, I'm finally getting better. And now I got to go back to work in the medical field, which is the most front line that you can get. Were you, I Honestly, guess. Honestly, it, it didn't really phase me. I guess you're kind of like, I was like, what I, are they going to do now? I was like, I just had too major. I didn't care at that point. I you, just, you I wanted to, to be back. You had to be like high risk COVID though, right? With underlying conditions or mm-hmm. was it just you were all free and clear at that point? No, I mean, I still, you know, I had two major surgeries. So, yeah, my immune system was, took a hit. Yeah. Like I said, I just wanted to be back at work, back to my normal routine. So I didn't care. It's better to live on your feet than yeah. die on your knees, right? Yeah, exactly. You had one of the greatest attitudes I've just ever heard. Was this your attitude when you your initial diagnosis came down? Like I said, I didn't, I didn't really have time to it was think. Just go, go, go. Let's just, get it done. Let's... Yeah, it was just... You know, honestly, I to me, I wasn't different than anybody else that walks through the cancer center where I work. You know, I'm. It is what it is. So now it's it's nothing was going to change it. Um, when you initially found out, they're like Tara, you got can cancer. Can I be honest with you? I kind of wasn't surprised because I, I know this is going to sound really weird, but when they told me that they saw something on my mammography that was abnormal, I just had like an intuitive feeling that. It's probably something. I don't know why. Just I just so it didn't it didn't kind of surprise me. I always say you you, you wish for the worst because if the worst happens, then you got it. Yeah, you I don't know. I I don't know why. I just I just kind of had that that gut feeling. And I'm not a negative person, but it just I said ah because that's just how I run. I you know when I was eight years old, I had a, a vascular tumor in my nose that I was in, in and out of hospitals in the city, and I had a a procedure that they were just testing out. So I said. Guaranteed, I got, I got something. So, um, was there, was there a point where your parents wanted to give you back? Yeah, my mom was like, <laughs> you know, you yeah. never you eat a vascular as a tumors. Kid. Did you, yeah. you didn't bring anything down here, did you? No, I don't no. want to catch nothing. She's like, you were never the kid that had the routine cold. I'm like, I know that's just that's just how I run. I wasn't totally surprised. So now it was just a mindset okay, now we're just now we now we're having a plan and now we're just going to go with the plan and and let's just go, let's just do what we need to do. Now, you, you had to some point tell your family. My mom was with me. Your mom was with you during the diagnosis? Yes. I bet your mom took it harder than you. Oh, my mother was a basket of tears. Yeah. You know, because who would think that we would have the same exact cancer? But for her, you know, she's a parent. And I'm her child. And, you know, as as a parent, you want to do everything for your child. And this was something that she couldn't take away from me. And and take it on herself. You always I want had to, take, to go through it's, it. It's something a parent can't fix. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's going to exactly. be like a, a helpless feeling. But yeah, most definitely. But and I just had this discussion with my kid, actually about my kid. Would you really want to raise your child and never have them feel what suffering's like? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you need that. That you need to let them experience mm-hmm. suffering on their own and deal with it on their own because ultimately it does make you stronger. Mm-hmm. And I have a feeling that's what it did for you. Did any, aside from your mother, did anybody else in your family ever flip out, freak out, say, oh my God, we're going to lose Tara. This is horrible. Let's throw her a going away party. Um, no. No? Honestly, I, I can't say that other family members of mine did. If anything, they were, they were strong for me. My mom, it, it, it was different. I mean, every time I turned around, she was crying. I'm like, and I'm like, mom, please you know, you're bringing me down. Well, yeah. she was, you know, you, you, you don't understand. I'm like, I, I don't under, I don't understand from your perspective. Cause no, I'm not a parent and no, I don't have any children, but I was trying, I was trying to absorb it myself. And every time I looked at her, she was crying. So it's like, I needed to be strong for me, but I had to be strong, be strong for, for your her, mother. For too, her. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you're, you're doing dual role. <laughs> and that's not her mother. I know her mother. Yeah. Her mother's. Yeah. That's where, Tara gets her vibrant, bubbly yeah. personality. Her mother's the same exact way. You know, and I don't want you to think that I was strong all the time. I mean, I had my moments, and I'll tell you now, I still have my moments. And I don't think really all of it kind of hit me until after. Because like I said, you're just going through the process to do what you need to do to deal with it and to get through it. Um, and it really kind of doesn't 
it finally start now I think it's really starting to sink to sink in after all this time. You're done fighting. The, but I don't I don't honestly think you're you ever stop fighting. Okay, let me rephrase that. You're done with this battle. This battle is coming to an end. But the war's not over. But yet. the war's but, not but over. The, you know, I every six months I go to my oncologist for my, my six month visit. And I just saw my oncologist a couple of weeks ago and she said, Tara, you know, you're cured. I thought to myself when I left, you know, I may be cured from a scientific standpoint, but you're never cured of the fear. Right. And so well, that fear, that's my constant struggle every that's day. What I was gonna, when you go to your oncology appointments, what's your anxiety like for that every time? Is it, or do you say, do you go in there saying like, oh, they'll probably find something? Or do you go in with, like, I know you're going to go in with a positive attitude. Well, I go but... in the positive attitude and, and I, I, I have it in my head. You know what? What's going to be is going to be. And we'll deal with it. Well, true courage. They, true courage is defined as being afraid, but doing it anyway. Right. So the fact that you're fearful, if you weren't fearful, I'd say there's something wrong with you. And I think there's there's more strength by saying that, yeah, I am afraid. Of course. I am, yeah, I'm afraid. Take the power of the fear right away. Yeah. You know, if you if the, if fear knows you're afraid of it, then it's it's got you. It's got you. But you're just waiting for it seems like you're waiting for that other shoe to drop. But I think you've you have some well earned relaxation time and some peace time. Mm-hmm. The fact that you're in the room here, I don't think you're getting a peace today. Well she had to bring a bodyguard with her. <laughs> <laughs> in the studio is our very own Eric Engelhart. We make fun of him enough, we figured we'd bring him in here. <laughs> well, he's he's the monitor for our um our dental development project, you know, because they want to, you know, he's on, he sits on our board, so he wants to make sure we're doing the right thing. But I think, I think it's important that when you're going through whatever you're going through, that you allow yourself to feel what you're feeling. If you're having a bad day, okay, it's a bad day. You know, if you're feeling good, you're feeling good. I had this motto that I I didn't want to totally feel sorry for myself, but if I was going through a moment and I was feeling down and I wanted to cry and I wanted to scream and I wanted to shout, then I was going to do it. I was going to do it for my 10 minutes and it was over and it was done and now now we're moving on. That's something I've recently learned and I do it myself. Like if I get, if I identify that I'm upset and I have to identify it, sometimes it takes me a while to identify, Mm -hmm. but I'm like, all right, Kevin, you got five minutes. You got five minutes to be pissed off Mm -hmm. and then let it go. And I, I, I just, I just did it this morning. You have to. Then it goes and masturbates, and everything's all. all well, good. but even when I'm feeling good, it's, it's there's, there's no wrong time of day for that, is there? <laughs> Except maybe when you're in church. And hey, listen, if the mood. I was going to say you, that one time you did it in church. That was wrong. <laughs> I'm not Opie and Anthony. You've had all these different surgeries. You've had all these different treatments, and you're, you're fighting the, this constant fear. Give our audience a window into one of those darkest times that you had, where maybe you doubt, doubted the fact that you're going to get through it. You said that there are some times when you had it, and I know you present this really upbeat. you got a great attitude, but you do present this upbeat. But if you told me you were like that all the time, I'd say you're full of shit. Mm-hmm. You're full of shit because you're human. So give us a window into one of those times. I think it was after one of my surgeries. I was home and I... You know, you got, I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm like, is this process ever going to end? Like, am I ever going to get back to normal or looking normal? You know, for a woman, you know, your breast is your, your, your feminine, makes you feminine. And I. So I say that about Michael. Yeah, time. it's just, <laughs> it, you know, and, you know, you go from having something that you've had all your life that you were born with and now they're removed and now you're going through this whole process. And I was like, am I ever going to be me i'm trying to relate to me be me again and i will tell you people look at you differently after you've had cancer i do um you got got cooties no they do they're like oh my god you 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 have cancer and then like you know and then when you tell people that you've actually had your breasts removed oh that takes on a whole different you know it's one thing you say i had a boob job and my boobs are bigger now or whatever oh you did and then you say you have your breasts removed and they're like yeah Listen, it wasn't because I really wanted to. I, I had to. I, I just didn't like these things hanging on my yeah, chest, so I, so I got them say, taken yeah, off. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's. I guess to relate you know. it to our audience, our the majority of our audience, not all of them are men. And imagine if you went to the doctor and said, your life, your doctor tells you your life is not going to change at all, but we got to take off your nuts. We got to remove your testicles. Yeah. 
And that is an, that is an identifiable yes. male trait. Mm-hmm. Although, here's the difference, and I, this is why I think it's, it's more difficult for women. Other than Mike, not too many people walk around with their nuts hanging out. I was going to say, what would I scratch in the morning if I didn't have nuts, you know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So women, women's breasts are, fr- a, are front say, and center. I don't want right. to say it's their identity, but it's, you know, it's part of it. And that's, that's one thing. How were you, like, psychologically when you first looked at yourself and they took your breasts off it? Well, I was I was a little nervous at first because I didn't know what I was going to see at the end when they first took them off with the tissue expanders. And when I removed my bandages, I'm like, well, either this is going to be really bad or this is going to be okay. When they took the expanders out. No, this, the expanders are in. They're in. Okay. Because I imagine you take the expanders well, out. It looks like eggs nailed to well, a wall. I mean, I knew I wasn't going to have my nipples but am i going to be flat like what am i going to what am what you am look i going like to look like a barbie doll so actually it looked like Ken you, doll. Yeah, no it, it, you look like you did have something so i i'm like oh this is not as bad as i was thinking it was going to be nobody will be able to tell when it's cold in a room yeah no, oh my god yeah like it was, that that was the best part i think the best part was i didn't have to wear a bra for a couple so, years i am so sorry Tara. i'm not i'm, I'm no it's okay i'm not but it, it's I'm I'm thinking about this, and now you you you've gone through those those dark times, and you had to cope a certain way. Are you a drinker? I had to laugh. You no, just, I had to laugh. So, I would make fun of myself. I'm like, oh, this is like, I would, but that's how I got through smooth. it. Smooth. Yeah, like yeah, like oh, this is great. I don't have to wear a bra. Like I don't have to Aerody- worry. Yeah, aerodynamic. Yeah. She started running again because the wind just <laughs> yeah, went right like, around her. You know? Yeah, it was great. You know, that's how I got through it. Right, and then. But, it was nice to see as I was going through the process, the change. It's like okay, it's this is, you're seeing progress. I'm, I'm seeing progress. It's almost like hitting puberty all over again. You know, and then my plastic <laughs> surgeon, I absolutely love her, love her to death. You know, she took pictures from the beginning to the end, and then she brings out her phone and she's going through photos. She goes, "Now, do you like these? Do you like these?" You we'll like we'll these? post those pictures. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I'm only kidding. But to to drive your point home, so attitude yeah. to me is everything. We've seen it in the police world, and I know this is documented fact where guys have been shot in the chest, and they had that attitude of that will to survive attitude, and they survived. And I also know of police officers who are shot in the finger. And they're like, oh, my God, I'm dead. This is going to – and they've died. They it's bled out. Defeatist attitude. Right. And Because when that attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. So I do believe that you are here today because of your attitude. I do like your coping mechanism because most people – I think the majority of people in your situation would probably turn to something to numb it. Like the, the, I guess you can't really drink at that point, but maybe some other way, some bad behavior. You could be a nasty son of a bitch. But you chose humor. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. I really do. So, I, And like I said, I think that's what got you through is the, the attitude that she has. You know, the, the upbeat attitude and, hey, we're, we're going to get this. I think that saves, that saves a lot. That saves a lot. Because you also see people at the end of their life, they're like, it's, they, they, you see them just lose their will. They got quit. Right. Them. Yeah. And I don't think you ever. Well, you're too young to lose your will. I mean, like I'm not done yet. But that's ultimately the truth. The, the truth, though, is something. Whatever you believe in, believes that you're not done yet. Well, you need. You know, I I believe that there's a higher being, and and my faith has definitely brought me to where I am today. So I think it's important that you believe in something. I'm not questioning why I'm going through this, but just give me the strength to go through it. We're and that's not not. Prying, getting too per- Were you in a dating relationship or anything at this point? No, I was not. It's probably a good thing. Yeah, no, it, it was it was good that I probably wasn't. I've I've heard a lot of stories at my doctor's office of of women who have been in the same situation that I was, and it was in a relationship, and their significant other had actually walked away. Yeah, they left could, them. They, they couldn't look at them anymore. I said, couldn't look at them anymore. You know, once they. Had you know breast no, reconstruction surgery? The no and... nipple thing is kind of freaking me out a little bit. Maybe no, I'm, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. But I will be mm. honest with you. For some, for me, who's at this point in my life, I am single and I don't have anybody. That is a fear that the opposite sex will look at me totally different. W- maybe for it's men, it's got to be in the back of your mind. It does like, you know, constantly. Maybe for maybe a man should have that in the back of his mind, but women should never have that in the back no. of their mind. No, I'm we, dead serious. Or, I'm I'm not making a joke. I'm dead serious. At any given time, I've said this for a long time, at any given time, a woman could go out 
to wherever and bring a guy home. Might not be the guy you want to bring home, but nevertheless, it depends on how much you're willing to lower your standards, I guess. That's why she came in here. I don't <laughs> understand. Lower her standards yeah, being here. No. I don't understand how you would think that that would be true. Because I'm telling you right now, I the, of the people that I know, I don't think that would hold them back from dating you. You had cancer. It's not like you can catch cancer. Listen, you got syphilis or something, that's a discussion you need to have because that stuff can last forever. Yeah, but, the, you know, the mindset of people is like, well, is she going to get cancer again? And, like, how long is she going to be around? Like, this and it's, it's normal for short people Short-term relationship that's that long-term. <laughs> <laughs> then it's on, you know, till just take till death do you part very seriously, even if it's only short-term. But that, that your attitude is is really, really good. Now, we got into a little bit in the beginning, and I want to get back to it. Being in the medical field, your experiences, can you peg something that's changed in your bedside manner when you deal with patients? I have a lot more patience, I think. Patience, not patient. Yeah. I think that's where empathy comes in yeah, now, too. Yeah, you know. Did you ever have to get on one of the one of the doctors or nurses or, or something that maybe wasn't treating specifically a, a cancer patient? The best where you think, hey, we can do a little bit better with this person. You don't understand what no, they're going I've, through. No, I've had faculty. Um, we were we were talking about patients in general, and some of our patients that come in, you know, they're they're stressed, they're stressed out. They can they're agitated. Sometimes they're not the friendliest. And you know, I tried to explain to my staff that I, I work with. You know, you have to understand something. I, you know, these patients they're scared, and it may not give them the right to act the way they do and, and sometimes not be nice and, and be forgetful. But, you know, th they're fighting for their life here. There's and a then, lot more going on in their mind. mind yeah. than, than, you know, you know, oh, okay, so they forgot, you know, when their appointment was and they had to call you back and say, you know, what, when's my appointment? When am I coming? And, you know, you just, you have to be, you have to have a lot more patience with them and just kind of understand where they're coming from. I said, and I've been there and I've walked in their shoes and, you know, every time they walk through that door, they don't know what they're facing. Is this going to be a good day? Is this going to be a bad day? Am I in remission? Am I not? Do I have to change my treatment? They don't know. So now for me, it's, I, I get it. Like I understand their thought process. I understand how, you know, their fear. I understand, you know, why they may react a certain way. And so I just, you know, tell my colleagues, just just put yourself in, in their position and you'll look at it differently. They won't be sometimes as such an annoyance to you as, as, as you think they are because, you know, they forgot their appointment or whatever the case may be. I owe a whole list of, of medical professionals apologies because when I am stressed out and I'm anxious about something, I am the most belligerent asshole on the planet. I really am. And I will start yelling at people. I will treat them like shit mm -hmm. because I'm uncomfortable. He usually apologizes right. to me like every afternoon. <laughs> call me up, and yell and scream. <laughs> yes, I constantly berate Mike. It's it's just the way that it is. But I think it also teaches you how to how to communicate with people a little bit better. I was going to say, do you ever like one of the patients that you're dealing with? Do you ever tell them your story? You know, to bring let it home, them, let them know that some of my patients know, you know, what has happened to me. Um. Well, let me, t you think you got it bad? Let me tell you. Okay. I, I had both of them removed. Then I got brain cancer. And then, then COVID I, hit. Then COVID hit. <laughs> and I had this thing on my nose for the year when I was eight years old or whatever that was. Yeah. And then these two assholes brought me down into a basement and made me talk about it. <laughs> I can't see how it wouldn't change you. I will bet you that if, if one of your patients knows the hardships that you went through, they're going to listen to you. I don't care what the doctor knows. The doctor could have all the medical experience in the world. You've gone through it. They're going right to you. Yeah. You know, you know and sometimes, like, I'll only share if, if, if they ask. Maybe something like this. You have no idea what I'm going through. Well, funny you should say that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Is that is that how the conversation starts? Sometimes, yeah. Oh. Well, we're a recent colleague of mine um, who I'm very close with. She's going through something um, very similar to what I went through. And so we actually were just conversing the other day, and I said to her, I get it. She goes, I know you get it. She goes, I totally know that you get it. I said, so you have my number. You just reach out to me. You need me to be with, there with you at a doctor's visit? I'm there. Like, because 
I get it. You know, I mean, that's important to uh, Kevin and I went through similar situations and we both get it. You know, we, I could talk to Kevin. I could call Kevin one day and say, you know, just start spewing off. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, you need someone who's been there. You know, it's a been there, done that thing. You know, I've, I've been there. I know what you're going through. We also check up on each other. Like, if I don't hear from him for a couple of days, because, we, again, we talk literally every day. I, I know mm-hmm. I know way too much about this talk guy. I talked to him three times before I even got here today. Right. <laughs> but if I don't hear from him for a couple of days, I'll be like, hey, just checking up. You know, we, where were we the one night where you had the runoff? You had something going on. I check on the, hey, everything work. He didn't tell me what it was. I'm like, hey, did everything work out? Now, you're. do you ever reach out to people like that who may need some just mental assistance, just oh, some yeah. guide? I mean, all the time. Like, I, I just saw my friend the other day, and I said, are you okay? And she's like, yeah. I said, remember where I am. She goes, I know. Yeah. So, I, I you know, I, I do. You're, you've gone through this stuff, so you have a uh, – I'm going to say a duty now to help duty. others. I did. I said duty. He said duty. We're talking about all sorts of things. We're talking about detitification, vaginectomies. Duty. <laughs> Denutification, right? <laughs> we're making up all sorts of words, and we're trademarking all of them. Yeah, absolutely. So those, those people that you help, do you go to any support groups? Do you do anything like that? You know, that? I haven't. And my, my friend said to me, you know, you should go <clears throat> to a support group, and I, I probably should. I just I just haven't. Made it there yet? There's people there who need you. I was going to say, it's, it's just your telling, telling your story is going to help someone else. And that's why we do this. Because like we said before, you're not alone. You're right. not the first one that went through it. You're not going to be the last one that went well, through it. Well, you know, I did tell, you know, my, my breast surgeon that feel free to give my number to patients who are going through this, who need to talk or have questions and maybe don't feel comfortable asking certain questions. And I have nothing to hide. So if I can help somebody in some way... Here's my number. Have them call me. When you were going through that, you know, all of your, your surgeries, did you ever seek like any therapy, like psychiatrists um, or psychologists or? No. No, you just did it all on your own. I just kind of. Winged it. Winged it. I think your breast surgeon should advocate for your dating. Say, look, you, you want a good time? Call this girl. I did a really good job. Oh, they're trying. This. No, they're, they're trying. <laughs> She's actually called the, when I tell people who my breast surgery and they're like, you got the breast whisperer. The breast <laughs> whisperer. <laughs> I mean, I mean, she's, I have to say she's very like, it's like a work. She's very great at what she does. It's like. She's like the Michelangelo oh my goodness, of breast. Like, she, you know, everything intricately detailed. That's just, that's just. Freckles. Everything, right? I, I told you I'm still not done. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tara, I need I need like a birthmark put on it, you know, <laughs> something to make it a little more natural looking. Now, no, now they do tattooing, so that's my next step. Oh, Never yeah. got tattooed in my life. Now I get tattoos. <laughs> there you go. I don't really like tattoos. I don't think anybody should get them. All right, yeah. I think they're they're horrible. <laughs> they waste Eric. money. Yeah, Eric, I think you should. Let's advocate for not getting tattoos. How's that? I think you've earned a tattoo. Are you going to get one of those cancer survivor tattoos? No, it's actually they tattoo your nipples. Oh boy! <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> Ouch! They they tattoo them on? No, the nipple that's created they tattoo over it. I guess to make it look more real. I don't know. This is all new to me, so I'll let you know about I, that one when it's done. I am I, now. I'm going to have to do some research. Kevin's got tattoos of his nipples on his back. <laughs> You laugh at that? Okay, listen to this. So when I was in college, no, it wasn't in college. It was right <laughs> after I was in college. I had a little too much to drink. I wanted to go get a tattoo. I thought it would be, because I used to moon a lot of people, I thought it would be <laughs> hilarious to get nipples put on my butt cheeks. So next time I moon somebody, look like a big pair of boobs. <laughs> right? Sounds hilarious, right? I get there on the chair, tattoo artist is about to start, and he goes, hey, bro, what if you go to prison? You hear that silence in the room? Same silence I had. I'm like, yeah. But then I was I was thinking about getting a line because I thought it would be funny to have a line going this way instead of up and down. And I, I never ended up doing it. But that was a different type of nipple they were going to tattoo on there. Yeah. T- I am very, I don't know what the right word is, intrigued, but I'm, I'm intrigued. I don't know. It, you know, it's a, it's amazing what they do nowadays, uh, cosmetic surgery. The suffering of tattooing your nipples. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, but like I said, the whole pro- – I never knew the intricacy of, of the whole process. And it, but I'm sure just, this is all new. They didn't have this 30 years ago. Probably not. Yeah. 
Probably not. Well, the one thing but... I want to ask you is you, you've talked about all this stuff very openly and very honestly prior to your surgeries, prior to your mother's surgeries. Was this like an – were you this open about discussing things like this? Yeah. Oh, you were. Okay. So that didn't change afterwards. No, it didn't change. You know, I, I had groin surgery. Like I ripped my groin muscle, actually ended my college football career. And you lose all sorts of humility very fast when you got six Jamaican nurses shaving you down in your nethers. So, Especially since you're Irish. Well, it was like, again, like a Ken doll. <laughs> we got Barbie. We got Ken. Uh, Tara, listen, we're coming to the end of this thing here. And, and to end our time in this studio, I would like to ask you for the last time, what do you think? You've gone through all this different suffering. You've had two boobies removed. You've had, <laughs> you've had brain cancer. You've had this, this really tough life, really tough go at it. What do you think it's taught you? I think it's taught me that I've, I found strength in myself that I never thought that I've had. And just a new outlook on life. You know, your life can change in a matter of a second. And I think now I really don't take for granted the life that I have. You know, I, I cherish that I'm here. You know, life is too short and I try to to live it the best way I can in a meaningful way, not only for myself, but for others and to help others. You owe it to others. You yeah, really I owe do. it to others. Um, you know, especially the people that were there for me. So I, I listen, I'm the type of person I love to give and I love to give and I don't I don't want anything in return. I know you brought pastries. Yeah, you know, I just like cool. that, that's just to me, there's always a greater feeling in giving than receiving. And so whatever I can give back for to anybody who's, who's helped me through whatever that I've gone through and, and just in life in general, that's that's my outlook. That's an amazing story. That's an amazing story. You know, I, unless I, unless you replace cancer with AIDS, giving is not better than receiving. <laughs> I, I just think her positive attitude is, I mean, that's, that's what, what got me through it. I mean, that is, that is fantastic. When, you know, I've known Tara for a while now and. When we were talking one day, I said to Kevin, I said, I got the perfect person to come on. He's right. I mean, you're just, right. you're, you're vibrant. It took you a while to get in here, though, because I know you were a little <laughs> hesitant on doing all that stuff. But you notice how much more relaxed she was than an hour ago. Oh, it's it's like she she's ready to move in down here. <laughs> Tara, thank you so much for coming in today. I well, really thank appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It. I think your, your story is definitely going to help people. I know. Without a doubt. Mike, this is a really bittersweet situation. We're saying goodbye to our studio. Yeah, I mean, it's like a surreal moment now. I... It's like sending your kid off to college. <laughs> it really is. Or marrying off one of your kids or something, you know. I mean, I was thinking on the way up. I mean, this is my last trip up here. Because we don't socialize. I'm not coming up to see you. I only come up to, <laughs> to do the show, you know. It's really sad because this studio has been so good to us. It, we've had a lot of people in here. We've laughed. We've cried. This studio has grown, and we've grown mm -hmm. from this. And... and we owe it to the studio. This is this is a home now. But the truth of the matter is, is we've outgrown this studio. We will always be on Google, Spotify, Apple in audio form. But now, and the next time you see us and hear us. See us is the key word. Yes, we will be on YouTube. Make sure you like and subscribe. We'll always be available the same way you've been listening to us all throughout. We thank you so much for your love and support. Before you go, there's three things I want to say on audio before we get out of here. Visceral. Prairie Fire, and Episode 9. <laughs> the last time you'll ever hear it in the studio. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Suffering Podcast, The Suffering of Cancer with Tara Madalone. And let's think about all the stuff that we learned today. Detitification and a vaginectomy are registered trademarks of The Suffering Podcast. It's better to live on your feet than die on your knees. Attitude in the worst situation shows your true character. But most importantly, you're never cured of fear. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Suffering Podcast, The Suffering of Cancer. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Follow Mike at Mike underscore Felace. Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. Of course, follow The Suffering Podcast at The Suffering Podcast. And we will see you on video on the next Suffering Podcast. <laughs>